Developing countries. What comes to mind when you hear the term developing countries? You've likely heard it a lot. It's been the topic of over 100,000 news articles and nearly as many YouTube videos just within the past year. While there is no universal definition, developing countries are simply countries that have much less money than other more developed countries. The term also implies a country's desire to improve its economic and social status. Now, frequently, developing countries aren't considered much more than just by this simple definition. But what about the details? What do you really know about developing countries and the people that live there? What are their lives like, particularly those of the disadvantaged and the poor? So this might be the typical image that comes to mind when you think of a developing country. A community with dirt roads, people without shoes, little education, polluted water, diseases. These places do exist, but there's much more to them than just our shallow perception of them. Developing countries are as complex and nuanced as any other country, with urban and rural areas, rich and poor people, educated and uneducated, various cultural traditions. The richest can live in luxury that surpasses that available here in the States, while the poorest are forced to live on less than $2 per day and struggle meeting their basic needs. Take a minute to try to imagine having only $2 per day to spend on everything you need to survive. Your housing, food, water, clothing, medical care, transportation. It's honestly really difficult to imagine, but more than 700 million people around the world, that's twice the population of the United States, or one in 10 people around the world, are forced to live in this type of poverty every day. What would you do if you couldn't buy basic medications? or didn't have any access to medical care at all? How would your life be different if you had to spend four hours of every day just to bring home water for your family to drink and cook with? What would it be like to live in a one-room house with dirt floors, mud walls, and a thatched roof with your four other family members? Learning about the problems of the extreme poor in our world sparked my recognition of my own extreme privilege and started me on an adventure that redirected my career and the goals for my life. After earning my bachelor's and master's degrees in mechanical engineering from the University of California, San Diego, developing countries weren't really on my radar. So I did what most mechanical engineers do and took a typical mechanical engineering position, working in aerospace on the Predator C aircraft, a prototype stealth bomber drone. As you might imagine, I remember thinking, wow, this is so awesome. <laughs> mechanical design, flight testing, working to protect my country, good money and prestige. It was all I had ever really wanted. But the euphoria soon wore off, and I realized that working in defense wasn't for me. I really wanted to work on engineering projects that provided direct positive benefits to our world. So after moving on from that job and working as a mechanical engineer in a few other companies and earning my professional engineering license, I stumbled upon Engineers Without Borders, an international development organization that works with developing communities to help them bring themselves out of poverty. In short, developing communities tell us what they need to improve their lives, such as housing, clean water, toilets, and we work with them to help them accomplish those goals. The goal of the project I started working on was to provide clean drinking water to a community of 4,000 people in rural India that had been devastated by the famous 2004 tsunami that affected much of southern Asia. Overall, I found my engineering skills and experience to be more than adequate for the technical side of this project. Pumps, piping, building design. These things I knew really well. But I soon found out that there was much more to this project than just the engineering. The water treatment system we constructed had to fit within the society and culture of this community and be operated and maintained by these people over the next few decades. And this was no easy task. How should we design this system to fit within this community and take advantage of their innate strengths? In short, how should we design the right system for them and not just engineer the system right? This human side of development and the creativity it requires are known in development to be critical to project success. If we didn't address these issues, their water treatment system would likely fail soon after it was constructed. Now, the characteristics of the community we needed to understand included their education, incomes, preferences, aspirations, culture, religion, social structure, just to name a few. And understanding these things helped us design and select certain parts of the water treatment system, such as where to locate it within the community, 
how people would access the clean water, and how much to charge for the clean water. One of the ways we described these aspects of the community were household interviews. So during the project, we were invited into over 50 households where we were able to ask structured questions of community members to help us design their water treatment system. But more importantly, this gave us a lot of face time with the community so that we could really understand their perspective and their problems. And the resulting rapport and trust that we built with them over, over the years of this project proved to be critical to the project's success. Additionally, these household interviews gave us a lot, gave the, uh, the uh, community members the opportunity to thank us, sometimes by singing or with flowers, which were really special experiences. Unfortunately, my engineering skills and experience really left me feeling out of my element when addressing these aspects of the project. I really had to study up to get good at this human side of development. I learned that talking with community members and, and discussing solutions to their problems were the keys to success. As the famous development practitioner Paul Pollock once said, I have learned more from talking with these poor farmers than from any other thing I've done in my life. I totally agree, and it is just that simple. Listen and communicate with the poor to help them solve their problems. That Engineers Without Borders project and the two others I've started since then, one constructing 32 permanent houses in the same community and another building another water treatment system in another community, have allowed my team and I to improve the lives of over 1,000 people in rural India while also gaining a lot of experience in development ourselves, and particularly in that human side of development. Now, currently, I'm continuing my study of the human side of development by pursuing my PhD in civil systems engineering at the University of Colorado Boulder. While my research is just getting started, I plan to investigate how human behavior affects sanitation infrastructure in the rural communities of Southeast Asia. My perspective on development to date has primarily been at the community level, seeing firsthand what the poor must deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. But the global perspective paints the truer picture. With over 700 million people living in poverty and billions lacking access to basic infrastructure like housing, clean water, and sanitation services, it's clear that there's a lot of work left to do. Before getting into this line of work, I knew little about poverty or its scope and everyone around me seemed to know about as little as I did. But now, it's obvious to me that eliminating poverty in our world is one of the biggest challenges of all time, and it's something that really should be tackled by all of us. For me, I plan to continue my work in development and plan to teach at schools and universities about engineering and the human side of development. My goal is that my students will learn about poverty and understand its scope, in the hopes that they will also choose to work to improve the lives of the poor. So I'd like to take this opportunity to invite you all to take your own steps to help eliminate poverty in our world. Start by learning about developing communities and the people that live there. And if you can, visit them. Seeing and hearing firsthand from the poor about their lives will certainly change your perspective. If you're a student, know that your skills, eagerness, and perseverance can improve the lives of others, particularly when applied in developing communities. For us adults, I know that changing careers isn't in the cards for most, but sharing our extreme privilege by supporting development organizations like UNICEF, IDE, or Save the Children can make a really big impact. They really do great work around the world and magnify your donation by investing in what developing communities need most. So, with little perspective and a touch of empathy, each of us has the power to help the poor of developing communities rise from poverty and give them the gift of a healthy and happy life. Thank you.